find my feet. Okay, so I'm Jackie Cliff. I'm a researcher at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I'm talking to you today about the UK MECFS Biobank, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about and you've just had a very good talk about what we can do with some of the samples there. But I'm actually an immunologist by training and we've been doing some immunology work with the, some of the samples in the UK MECFS Biobank and some virological um, characterisation as well, so I'll talk to you about that as well. So the structure of my talk is to talk generally about the biobank, then the immunological characterization, which we have published some of the findings, and there's a little bit more which we've recently discovered, which I'm going to talk about. And then I'm going to talk to you about the results from a pilot longitudinal herpes virus study, which we've conducted. So just to introduce the UK ME CFS Biobank team, the Cure ME team that we have at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. It's actually a, a growing band of people now, I'm pleased to say. So unfortunately, Eliana had to leave last night because she's gone to a Euromean conference in Riga in Latvia, which was prearranged. And Luis Nicole is the leader of the um, Cure ME Biobank, and he's based in Canada now, and unfortunately he couldn't be here either. We've heard about Caroline, who's a research nurse, who is absolutely fabulous at recruiting patients and um, taking blood from them. And now we have another research nurse called Dio, who is following in her footsteps extremely well, so we're blessed with these people. And then we have epidemiologists, um, administrators, and then down here we have those of us that actually do lab-based science. And as you can see, it's not many of us. <laughs> it's myself and postdoc Zirk who works part-time on this project. So there's a theme here, actually, about having enough capability to be doing the um, studies. And then Tiny Clark is our geneticist that we have at the London School, who's also involved in the MRC application. <coughs> so, sorry, some of my titles seem to have gone. So the samples that we have in the UK MECFS Biobank, and I just think I might have a conversation with you, Carl, over a coffee maybe, because I think we have more information than you've been actually accessing potentially because they are very well characterised patients. They, we have cases that are confirmed as MECFS according to the Canadian criteria or the Institute of Medicine criteria. Um, and, so, and they are all adults between age 18 and 60 years old. We've characterised them at the moment um, into two groups, so they're mild and moderately tend to go together and then the severely affected, although we have the information in the database to enable a, a, a tighter narrowing of the research windows. And as we've discussed, we have healthy controls in the biobank and then people with disease control with multiple sclerosis based on the idea that they may also be suffering similar symptoms but different symptoms as well, so they're a disease control. And we can group match by age and sex and area of residence. Um, one of the conversations that I've been having over the last couple of days is that actually it's quite a narrow um, part of the UK population that we've got involved in the UK Biobank at the moment, based on the fact that Caroline and Dio literally go to people's homes and to recruit patients and to take the samples. So they're largely London and Norwich based. Depending on the future scope of work, that could expand. And the samples are actually stored at the Royal Free Hospital in North London. And so here is liquid nitrogen stack showing samples being arranged in the um, tank. And there is a large database, so to the next slide. These are the data which are available. But this is kind of a summary, and there's literally hundreds and hundreds of data points for each patient which are available in the database. So there's questionnaires which patients fill in before the samples are taken related to the symptoms that they experience, the socio-demographic de socio -demographic variables, health histories um, for themselves and for their family, uh, potential risk exposures, um, what risk factors, what do they um, perceive they were exposed to before they became ill. A medical outcome survey has been conducted which has been published with Caroline as the first author. Um, general health questionnaires, sleep, sleepiness scores, fatigue scales, pain and fatigue analogue scales. So all of these data are available for every patient. And then clinical assessments are conducted on every patient, um, including glucose, proteins, um, blood pressure, etc. And then blood samples are taken. So these are kind of like the clinical tests which are conducted on every patient before the sample goes into the biobank. So we have a full blood count, blood chemistry, creatinine levels, etc. Um, C-reactive protein levels, rheumatoid factor levels. 
So all of this information is available. One of my big concerns, Carl, which we do need to discuss actually in a little bit more detail, the protocol for the UK MECFS Biobank is that all the samples are taken and collected and transferred to the Royal Free Hospital as quickly as possible. And they're all supposed to be stored within eight, um, sorry, six hours of collection. So I, I'm hoping that the 14 hour sample that you had was an outlier. I'm pretty sure it must be. And the range is pretty much that most of them are all collected within the six hours. It's not ideal, it would be better as you say in Poland if they have the clinic right next to where they're doing the storage perfect but that's not sustainable on a larger um, cohort like this. So samples, whole blood samples are collected, serum, plasma, an EDTA or sodium heparin depending on the type of analysis that people want to do with them. Red blood cells are stored in EDTA or in sodium heparin. These cells um, are really important, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So these are frozen live cells which enable us to then do immunological characterization, which is what I'm going to come to next. Um, we've stored RNA in PAX gene tubes. So this is a special tube which just freezes the cells directly into a preservative agent which keeps all the RNA species exactly as they are in the blood. So we can do transcriptomics here. And the latest count is in October 2018, there were 36,000 aliquots sitting in the um, biobank. And the point of the biobank is that we then have samples for people to access to do their fantastic studies with. And so to date, these are the people that the UK CFS Biobank have been working with and delivering samples to. Um, so we started off doing the work in-house. So Eleanor Riley was a professor of immunology at the London School, and I'm going to talk about some of that work. Hazel Dockerell is my boss, and we're continuing with the immunology work. Um, we've started collaborating with people at UCL, particularly Joe Cambridge. But then Carl has accessed the samples, as he's just described, <laughs> used them to great use. Um, and then these are the other researchers who so far accessed these samples, and it's a growing list, and doing really quite a broad range of different assays and experiments with them. The UK MECFS Biobank has seen to be a good biobank and um, received an honourable mention at the UK Biobank of the Year Award, so I think the clinical team are very proud of this. <laughs> So just a little bit about how people can access the samples or the process. So these samples are all sitting in the biobank. Um, people who are interested in working with the samples fill in an application form, which is then reviewed. And so there's an, a guardian board. Um, sorry, I was expecting to have the, the slides here. We don't. Um, so I'm sorry, excuse me, for talking to the board a little bit more. These are not my slides. So um, the application is processed by a guardian board and undergoes scientific review for the quality of the research which has been conducted and if it's accepted then it goes undergoes the ethical review committee um, analysis as well from the, the UK MECFS Biobank and the UCL Royal Free um, Hospital people but separately the applicants will be um, undergoing their own ethical review of their um, the science that they want to conduct and then together then the when all the ethical permission is in place and the scientific approval is in place, then there can be an, a material transfer agreement and a data transfer agreement signed by both parties. And it's only after that that the samples can be released. This has been quite a kind of long process to set up, but now it's working, I think, a lot more efficiently. And so that people need to be aware that this is a process that people go, that they need to go through, and then the samples can be sent. Okay, so moving on to the work that we've been conducting at LSHTM, and again, this was work which was initiated by Professor Riley when she was at the school. The underlying hypothesis about what we're doing is that MECFS is associated with immune dysfunction, which results from or predisposes, predisposes to herpes virus infections, and that was the state of play when we actually started doing this work. It was maybe about four or five years ago, and the dogma in the field at that point was that herpes viruses were really important, and that there were some abnormalities in the um, immune system which could be detected. Particularly in the NK cell phenotype, there's been quite a lot of small papers that, um, published showing that there's a difference in the NK cell function in MECFS. And we also hypothesise that this immune phenotype will fluctuate over time because people's symptoms, as they fluctuate, then you would be able to detect that in the immune system as well. So the first question, can we detect immune dysfunction in people with MECFS? So this was a study um, which I did present last time we had this meeting, but there's a little bit of extra data. 
So we analysed samples from people with mild or moderate ME-CFS, almost 200, and people who were severely affected with ME-CFS, another 50 patients. And we included the multiple sclerosis controls and the healthy controls. And as you can see, we've got a, a dominance of females, as you would expect in this cohort. And the age is pretty similar across the um, disease groups. And the fatigue scale has also been calculated and it's obviously lowest in the healthy controls. So just to explain what we did with these cells, because this is going to be quite in-depth analysis I'm showing. Excuse me, I'm thirsty. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> So the fraction of the, cell, the um, samples which we're interested in is the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. <laughs> they give you a false one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a test. The way to save water. <laughs> so I will carry on. I'm just a little bit thirsty, but I'll carry on anyway. So blood cells are taken, blood samples are taken, and then they're centrifuged on something called FICOL, which actually separates the cells based on their, thank you very much, <laughs> based on their density. Um, so the blood cell is layered on top of FICOL and then it's centrifuged and then the heavy cells, the dense cells, which are the red blood cells and granulocytes, which are neutrophils, etc., pass through. And then we get this layer of peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which is frozen. And then we've run them on something called a flow cytometer. And this is something we have at the London School. It's an LSR2 flow cytometer. And essentially what we can do with this is to label cells. So we have a mixture of cells in our peripheral blood. And we can use antibodies, which are coupled to fluorescent antibodies. So that's just a way of labeling all the different markers that we have on our cells in our blood. And then we can pass those through. So this flow cytometer, like it's just literally the cells are flowing, past detectors. So you have a mixture of cells that have all been labeled with different colors and then a detector. And actually it's a various different detectors. So you can work out the combination of markers which are expressed on the surface of all the different cells that you have in your blood sample. So we've used this extensively to um, characterize the cells that we have in our patient samples. And apologies, this is head dense on um, data. But first, we looked at the natural killer cell populations, because as I say, that was the underlying hypothesis, was that we'd seen um, small studies where people had reported differences in the NK cell number and function. But if you look more closely in the literature, there have been discrepancies. So some reports showed that they were elevated in number, some said they were reduced in number, some said they were more active, some said that they were less active. And what we did was look at the healthy control population, the MS population, the mild moderate um, ME patients and the severely affected patients and NK cells you can subdivide them into different groups of types of NK cell and actually whichever um, subtype of NK cells or if we looked at them all together you can see there's really no difference across the different populations that we've looked at of any of the different NK cell types which was quite frankly disappointing but what we can also see is there's quite a spread as heterogeneity even within the healthy controls and so what we're seeing is spread of um, expression levels of the different types of NK cells in the patients. That's replicated in the pa um, healthy controls as well. And a part of the analysis I'm not showing is we then stratified based on cytomegalovirus infection. And we actually found that you could really um, distinguish between the different like NK cell high, NK cell low populations of PBMCs was more dependent on CMV co-infection. Sadly, so that was quite dis disappointing. We looked at the kind of major subsets of cells that we have in peripheral blood. Um, so we looked at monocytes, which are precursors to macrophages, different types of dendritic cells, which are really important for presenting antigen to T cells. So myeloid dendritic cells and plasmacytoid dendritic cells. We looked at B cells, we looked at T cells. And then we, within the T cells, we looked at CD4 T cells, which are helper T cells. And we looked at CD8 T cells, which are cytotoxic T cells, at the actual broad number of those and whether there was any change in the ratio. And as I say, the NK cells. And really, there was no difference across the populations. The only ones that we saw that were any different were in the monocytes and the dendritic cells. But the patient group, which was different, well, unfortunately, was the um, multiple sclerosis patients. So we did see some differences in the actual differentiation status of the CD8 T cells. Now, this work is published in our paper. Um, 
and it, I didn't show it last time I was here for a very good reason. We went into this with our kind of defined protocol of how we were going to analyze the CD8 T cells and the CD4 T cells. And there's different markers which are related to activation status of CD8 T cells and differentiation status of CD8 T cells. So we'd done our initial analysis based on those and not seen anything different. And then when we went to publish it, we sent it off and then we got the reviewers' comments back. And the reviewers' comments said, ah, what we think you should do, or what I think you should do, is actually a more complex analysis looking at all of the markers together. So we did that and actually we were quite excited to see differences. So there are differences in some of the patterns. So you can imagine you could have this as positive or negative, this is positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. You're actually starting to break the CD8 T cells up into lots of different categories of cell. And we saw really quite striking differences between the severely affected or the mild moderate um, ME patients and the healthy controls in some of these subsets. But they're not kind of the well-known immunological subsets. As an immunologist, I'm like, yeah, right, that's an effector memory cell or that's a central memory cell or anything like that. They are kind of transitional, unusual types of CD8 T cells, so we don't really know what it means. So when we published it, we put the data in there, quite frankly, to make the reviewer happy. So he said, yes, you can publish this. But we don't quite understand fully what it means. And this is something that we're following up on now is to um, actually go in with the hypothesis before we start doing the work and test directly whether we are able to replicate these results. What's interesting and what we didn't actually publish yet is that if you look at these markers, these are the markers that are the whole immunological study which are the best able to separate and discriminate the MECFS patients from the healthy controls or from the multiple sclerosis patients. So I think it's definitely worth following up. We also looked at something called mucosal associated invariant T cells. So the majority of our T cells that we have in our body have a huge repertoire. Different T cells are able to um, recognize different pathogens and respond to it. That's how the adaptive immune system works. So the same for B cells and for T cells. Mucosal associated invariant T cells are different and the name gives it away, they're invariant, they all recognize the same thing and they recognize um, vitamin B, um, complex derivatives based um, in the context of something called MR1 on the cell surface of the antigen presenting cell, which is very different from how conventional CD8 T cells would recognize their antigen. And what we found is that they were increased in number in the severely affected MECFS patients, not so much in the mild moderate. Um, patients, but also they can express different receptors on their surface as well as their T cell receptor, which is invariant. They're either CD4 or CD8, and we found in the severely affected um, patients they were nearly all CD8, so there's a skew. These are the um, mild moderate MECFS patients, the healthy control. So you can see there's a mixture of CD4 and CD8 T cells, where, mate cells, whereas in the severely affected patients they're largely CD8, which means that they're more cytotoxic. So we did do a little bit of predictive modeling based on the mate cell expression and the red line is the multiple sclerosis patients and the kind of orangey line here is the severely affected MECFS patients and the fact that it's kind of up in this corner shows that it has sensitivity and specificity to actually be able to discriminate um, severely affected ME from healthy controls which is this line here. But unfortunately, as you can see, it's completely overlying on the multiple sclerosis line. We've done some further work, also funded by Charles, thank you very much, <laughs> actually looking further at the mate cells. So what, what is it with these mate cells? So mate, mucosal associated invariant T cells, so that means that they largely home to the mucosal surfaces and there is a literature in ME that the microbiome is affected, as we've just been discussing, that maybe actually it's bacteria which are most important or potentially important in this. So as soon as we saw mates, we're like, oh, maybe this is really important. We want to understand a little bit more what's going on with these mate cells. And the previous work which we've done on the larger cohort, we had just analysed like the number of the cells in the blood. What we wanted to know is, are they, do they have a different function? So we took cells from healthy controls, again the different four categories of um, participant, and we stimulated, or didn't stimulate, with something called forbolester and ionomycin, which is an immunological cocktail to stimulate cells, or we left them just sitting in the growth medium as well. So on the left we have the healthy controls, and this is for a cytokine called interferon gamma, which is important, interleukin 17, or perforin, and perforin is related to killing efficacy of um, CD8 T cells. 
And so as you can see, the healthy controls, they at rest, before you stimulate them, they don't really make any interferon gamma and they don't really make much perforin or IL-17. And then you can stimulate them and they start making these things. The biggest finding that we had was this is the mild moderate group of MECFS. And as you can see, before you've even done anything with the cells, they are much more activated. They're activated actually in the bloodstream, which kind of means they're being triggered as uh, during the circulation. So I think this is potentially important. With the caveat that this was a small study <laughs> and we are going to follow up on it. So for the future perspectives for the immunological aspects, we have seen associations between MECFS and the proportions of differentiated cytotoxic T cells and mate cells. So I'm going to say emphasize it's an association. We don't know that it's causal at all. We don't know which way around the effect is going. We are looking at now how these difference, differences fluctuate with time and with changes in the symptoms. We have been funded by the NIH for a longitudinal study where samples have been collected every six months from participants. And we're going to reanalyze these um, types of cells at those different time points and relate that to the symptom scores that um, patients provide at the time of blood sampling. <coughs> We don't know really, quite frankly, as Chris says, what do we actually know? We don't actually know anything from this. But what could we start speculating about? Does this tell us about pathophys what does it tell us about pathophysiology of MECFS? Well, NK, um, sorry, CD8 T cells and mate cells, they are indicative of a persistent infection. They're, they're cytotoxic. The body, to me, seems like it's still trying to fight something. Which brings us nicely to the virology study. Can we detect herpes virus reactivation in MECFS? A virology <laughs> longitudinal pilot study. So <coughs> the reports of um, herpes virus infection in MECFS have kind of been mixed. There were some very early reports that Epstein-Barr virus is involved in MECFS, and a lot of people report um, development of symptoms after they've had what we'd call glandular fever, infectious mononucleosis. And yet there's mixed reports. Some people say it does link, some people say it doesn't link, looking both at serology and at viral load in the blood. Similar results have been found for other herpes virus family, um, such as herpes, human herpes virus 6 and human herpes virus 7. Again, widely reported involved or not involved in the MECFS, depending on the study, and also reports that cytomegalus virus might be important but inconsistent. Now, why are we getting all these inconsistent um, results? Well, we don't really know, but it might be related to the sample size, the small studies being <coughs> conducted, confounding, where people have not taken account of different factors which may be relevant. And also, I think this is really important, the heterogeneity both within and between study populations. So Carl's very <laughs> deftly shown that you can get completely different results in two different cohorts. We need to be doing <coughs> validation work. So we have one cohort and we have another cohort and we have another cohort. Do we find the same things repeatedly or not? But also what we've, oh, excuse me, what we've shown is actually the heterogeneity within a cohort as well. It's really important to account for. So we're looking for differences. Maybe we need to be doing stratification within our cohorts. Anyway, going to the herpes virus families, the name is derived from the Greek word herpion, which means to creep. And what this refers to is the latent recurring um, infections, which are, type of this, which are typical of this type of virus. So the majority of adults in most parts of the world are infected with a lot of these herpes family viruses. But most of us do not have persistent symptoms from that because the virus enters a latent phase and it lies dormant within cells. <coughs> and different members of the herpes family viruses um, reside in different sites. But of interest, herpes simplex virus 1 and 2 reside in neurons whereas most of the others involved um, become latent in different types of cell within the immune system. And as we know from MECFS, um, the nervous system and the immune system are involved. Um, we don't exactly know how, but there's some link there anyway. And some of these um, viruses lead to kind of common um, known viral infections like chickenpox, um, infectious mononucleosis, etc. In our previous study, when we did all the immunology, we also looked at the antibody concentration in the blood, which is a marker of whether someone's been exposed and infected with a particular um, infection. And also, so, and all of these graphs, there's a line here showing positivity. So anyone above this line, that sample is showing that the person is positive for that, so showing that they have been infected. 
and also the amount of the antibody, so it's a quantitative assay. And we looked for all of the different herpes virus families and found literally no difference in either the, the proportion of people who were seropositive across the patient groups or indeed in the amount of antibody which they were making. So there was no indication there. Again, the only difference that we found was in the people who had multiple sclerosis. But that just shows that people are infected. How does this link to actual virus reactivation? And for that, we really felt we needed a more sensitive test and more sensitive assay. People can detect viral load in the blood using more conventional assays, but it's not very sensitive. So we wanted to be able to detect reactivation. And we also wanted to be able to do it kind of more in real time and in an easy accessible sample. So what we did was develop something called digital droplet PCR assays. And those of you who know about PCR generally, you can take DNA and you can add DNA polymerase and all the reagents that you need, and you can get amplification. And if you include a fluorochrome with that, then you can detect that there is an amplification of your starting material. And you can do that in a quantitative manner. But it's a kind of semi-quantitative manner. The advantage of digital droplet PCR is it actually magnifies the signal by breaking the PCR reaction up into literally 20 20,000 separate droplets and in each of those droplet you either started with DNA or you didn't on a stochastic basis and it just gives you the opportunity to be much more sensitive in your assays and then you run the PCR and you count it in a detector machine and this is the output so this is a titrating amount of DNA and you see if you have a large amount of DNA then all of the sum all of the droplets, so all of these blue dots are showing like the output of from one droplet, they're all positive. And then as you start titrating the amount of DNA down, you get some negative droplets, a few more negative droplets, etc., etc. So you can see that you can um, be quite um, accurate with this method. So we undertook a pilot study, and this comes back to the, the GWAS application. <laughs> Well, we weren't quite sure about how well this was going to work. We recruited patients based on um, their previous serology results because we wanted to know that we, have, we were recruiting people that we either had good reason to believe that they were infected with some of the herpes viruses or that they weren't. And we asked them to um, complete very specific symptom questionnaires and they were asked about various different aspects of their um, symptoms, neuroendocrine related symptoms, um, malaise, related symptoms, immunological, etc. And we sent them kits where they could send back their saliva and their urine every month for six months, literally by putting it in the post. And we also asked patients to send more samples if they were experiencing a disease relapse episode, and we asked them to send samples on days one, three, and five. And then we were testing for a correlation between the symptoms and the viral load. <coughs> So we recruited 30 patients with ME-CFS, of whom 14 had mild moderate symptoms and 16 were severely affected, and 16 patient, um, people who were healthy controls. And we managed to achieve 85% follow-up, which I think was really quite beyond our expectations because we weren't really sure how well this was going to work, sending the packs out and then just trusting and hoping that they were going to come back, and they did. So we were delighted with that and we received saliva and urine samples. And we also received seven separate disease exacerbation episodes. Two of those were from the same patient. Um, so yeah, it, it's not a huge data set, but again, it, it shows feasibility. And then the clinical, oops, clinical health questionnaires covered 375 data points. These are just quickly to show that we did develop the DDPCR assays for each of the different herpes viruses that we were interested in. And there's two her human herpes viruses, six A and B, to a confusion. And so just looking at the saliva results, first off looking at um, the proportion of participants who had at least one positive sample. So if you look in saliva, we only detected these four different herpes viruses, HSV1, EBV, herpes, human herpes virus 6b and human herpes virus 7 and there's no difference really at the proportion of health controls or patients with ME-CFS who were positive for each one but you can see HHV7 nearly everyone was positive at least once in their sampling for HHV7 so this is shown in table and in graphical form and showing the same data but actually if we look at the absolute amount this is where we started seeing some interesting um, data 
so these are the individual patients and controls across the different time points and these are the healthy controls and these are the mild moderate people and then these are the severely affected participants and as you can see there's there's a higher viral load in the people with ME-CFS for HHV7 than there is for the healthy controls. And then this is showing the individuals across time. And you can see there's variability. So a lot of people are quite low, but then we have these other people who are quite high throughout. And there's some degree of fluctuation throughout the time course. Uh, EBV was not so interesting, um, essentially, again, we have a spread of data, so even within the healthy control, some people have a very low amount of EBV, some people have a high amount. There's no difference really between the patient groups, but what we did see was quite a lot of fluctuation in EBV, but we were seeing that in the healthy controls as well. And then HHV6B, there's almost a hint of something, but I have to emphasize this. It was a small study with not quite enough participants to be able to um, conclude anything from this. There does seem to be a hint towards something where the severely affected participants had more HHV6B shedding in their saliva, except for this one person who is in the healthy control group who had more HHV6 than anybody else. It's a heterogeneous thing. <laughs> so the perspectives on this, I mean, we are still conducting the analysis from this. We have the 375 um, clinical data points, which we've grouped together into groups of symptoms, and we're looking at the correlation. At a univariate analysis level, there is nothing obvious, but what we are doing is a multivariate analysis, and we're putting together the viral load, like the total viral load. We're also still analyzing, quite frankly, the urine data, um, because we have to do a, a a control against the number of cells, which human cells, which were in the analysis, and that's still ongoing. I'm really optimistic about this. I think when we started it, it sounded like a good idea to do it, but we really weren't sure, whether, one, whether we'd be able to develop the assays to be sensitive enough to detect any differences, and two, whether we'd be able to recruit people, and three, whether the DNA was going to be good quality DNA that came back that would enable us to do this. So I think we've proven that, I think it was one of the questions yesterday, is the DNA going to be good quality when it comes back in these saliva kits? It was beautiful. But we do really need larger studies to determine whether there is any link between the herpes virus reactivation and the ME-CFS symptoms. So I'd just like to conclude by saying this wasn't just me, this was a big team of people and to thank Eliana for leading the clinical team and the research nurses and particularly all the participants for participating. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you.